I'm Celine Williams, and welcome to the Leading Through Crisis podcast, a conversation series exploring resiliency and leadership in challenging times. Thank you for joining me today. We are here with Karen Reed, who is the CEO and Chief Confidence Creator of Speaker Dynamics, a corporate communications training firm featured in Forbes. While speaking through a webcam might be new to much of the world, Thank you, coronavirus. Karen has been teaching business professionals how to be effective on-camera communicators for nearly a decade. Welcome, Karen. I'm really excited to talk to you. Oh, Celine, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, I think this is a very important conversation in general right now because so much of our communication is on camera and is virtual. So I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about your experience and and you know, where you think the future of this is going as well. Yeah. And the really cool thing is I can be in Raleigh, North Carolina. You can be in Toronto, but it's like, we're in the same room together. Absolutely. I know it's great. <laughs> it's great. Your room has a very nice setup in the background. So I'm a little bit jealous of that. Um, I am loving your bookcase. I'd probably shift your angle just a little <laughs> bit if you allowed me to tweak your set. Uh, but, you know, honestly, if, if I would show up looking a mess, that would be really off brand. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, so I like to start with a sort of a big, broad question that is, you know, when you hear the idea of leading through crisis or leading in challenging times, what does that mean to you? Or what is your sort of experience and lens on that concept? So I would say that the crisis that I am most familiar with, <laughs> that truly was a crisis also was a blessing as well, because oddly enough, um, my business found product market fit in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of background, I mean, I've been teaching video communication skills for, you know, almost 10 years. And, you know, typically I was teaching maybe like the executive leadership team, people who would be like de facto spokespeople for their businesses. But when coronavirus hit and everything shut down and everybody migrated to platforms like the one we're on right now and, and all the other ones that are out there, suddenly on-camera communication skills became mission critical, not just for the executive leadership team, but for everyone. <laughs> so Absolutely. in my business, it went from like training, you know, the ELT to training the entire enterprise. And my team was not necessarily situated to scale. So I had to figure out a way to drink from the fire hose of demand and determine a way forward where I was not completely losing my mind, but still helping as many people as I possibly could, um, you know, given the incredible need for uh, just know-how and, and how to be better on camera. So it's, it's, I love that you have a very, this is not just a, here's my thoughts on leadership in challenging times, but you have a very specific story of the last year where you were put in a situation to lead through. And yes, and I help think, other people yeah. you know, lead through the lens. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was gratifying to be in that situation, but also scary <laughs> and confusing. And, you know, I feel like as an entrepreneur, you're constantly facing uh, this learning curve that is very steep. Uh, and I had yet another learning curve that was really steep, but, you know, we ended up uh, finding a couple of different ways to scale. You know, I, I increased uh, the number of folks on my team, but also I knew I needed some sort of automated option <laughs> that was yeah. going to help us uh, to be able to train, oh, 800 people on how to be better on-camera communicators. But, but having the book, um, which is coming out uh, March 9th, Suddenly Virtual, Making Remote Meetings Work, was also a way of amplifying the message because uh, you know my co-author is uh, one of the foremost thought leaders on meeting science. Uh, his name is Dr. Joseph Allen. And we had done a webinar the first week of March of 2020 uh, for Logitech because we were both subject matter experts. So think about where you were the first week of March of last year. You know, you kind of heard, you know, rumblings of something called coronavirus. Well, that webinar was focused on the modern meeting and what was going to happen to meetings over the next, you know, three, five, 10 years. And we postulated that a lot of them were going to be held using these video collaboration tools. Well, a week later, <laughs> the world shut down, like 1.5 billion people globally were told to stay at home. And so all the things that we predicted would happen within a 
you know, a couple of, well, three to five to 10 years happened within a couple of weeks. <laughs> and there was this like 20 times increase in the number of, of video calls uh, that were being made. And, and just suddenly everybody was having to communicate through the webcam. So I went off in one direction and tried to help all these clients, uh, both old and new, uh, to do this better. He went off in the other direction. He was helping people to be able to make these virtual meetings uh, effective and productive. And a couple of months later, we came back together and, and realized that we we're both working on the same problem. Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, you know, it'd be great if we could figure out some way to get the message out to more folks about how to do this better. So he had been doing all this research. I had all this real world application. So we brought that together to create Suddenly Virtual so that this data-based insights uh, that you can actually apply tomorrow. It's, it's very practical. Uh, there is some theory, but we wanted to make sure that people could use it almost like a workbook uh, and mm -hmm. then they could figure out a path forward. I love that because I have in the work that I do, I have like everyone, my clients went virtual fast. So I've been talking about remote leadership for years. And part of that is usually when you're running remote teams and you're going that way, you have a plan in place. You have a six month or a year long plan to transition to a partially or fully remote team and learn how to lead in that way. So yeah. under not 2020 rules, the way that you step into that is very different. But when you're thrown into it and you're thrown in the deep end that this is, we are now in a position where we have to lead remotely and now we're running meetings remotely, even just the, we're gonna take all the meetings we would normally do that are on our calendar and do them on video was a terrible approach and it happened all the time. Yeah. So, and you talk about Zoom fatigue. Well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense because people didn't understand that, you know, an hour spent on Zoom is not equivalent to an hour spent in a conference room. Uh, it, it requires so much more energy yeah. uh, and what you call emotional labor, which means uh, the amount of work that you have to put in to conduct yourself in a meeting. One of the most draining aspects of being on camera is um, something called surface acting, where you have to appear to be engaged mm -hmm. uh, and, and that can really take its toll. And, and also what happened too, I'm sure you saw it, Celine, is that people would schedule meetings back to back to back to back. And there was no time to task switch or to get real work done. And so people were extending their, their days, you know, out to, you know, gosh, 10 hours, 12 hours in some cases and, and just, yeah, productivity just soar but people were burning themselves out terribly. Uh, so I think at, at this point, I'm glad that the book is coming out at the time it is because I think that there's more of a strategic approach that's being sought or being implemented. And we wanted it to go beyond just gut feel. We wanted people to be able to read it and be like, oh, okay, there's science behind this. Okay, let's try this and see how it works for us and, and kind of have a, a, a way to apply the steps described in the book to their own situation. I. I think it's brilliant because like I've, so what you just said around surface acting, I've been saying the word, the language that I use, not having researched it just from what I've experienced is that this is very performative. When you're on camera on zoom, it's very performative and that's exhausting because you can't just be, if you're in a room with people, not everyone is looking at you. You don't feel like eyes are on you. You can do other things. So you're not engaged in the same way. Right. So what you said about surface acting is great language that has research behind it that you have, I'm assuming have some tactics and tips for that allow what I've been saying is a gut feel to yes. become real changeable and in action. This happened to me all the time, Celine. So when we wrote our book together, uh, what we did is we assigned who was going to be the lead author for each chapter. So sure. he would go off and write his sciencey stuff. I would go off and write my real world application stuff. And, and then we would go back in and add content to each other's chapters. Yep. And so what would happen with his is he would give the science and I'd say, oh, and I saw this happen with my client, da, 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 da. So I called myself his 
color commentator. And then he would go into my chapters and I would say what was going on in in my experiences with my clients. And he'd say, and this is the reason why you're seeing this. And and so it was really just such a learning experience for both of us, I would guess, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we were writing the book. Uh, and a couple of quick tips about the whole surface acting Please. thing that I suggest to my, my clients. One of the, the most wonderful techniques and tools that they have on Zoom is you can hide self view. <laughs> so if you go in the upper right hand corner on your Zoom box, you get three little dots that pop up. If you click on that, it'll give you the option to make yourself disappear because that's one of the big barriers to your effective uh, communication on video is whenever we see ourselves on the screen, it can be disconcerting and it can be distracting because when have you ever seen yourself communicate in real time? (laughs) Never, (laughs) but now you are. And sometimes we're so fixated on monitoring our own performance that we lose what is the most critical aspect of being effective on camera, which is our authenticity. Right. So in order to get out of your own head, take yourself off the screen and out of the equation. And that way you can get back to being the communicator that you are in person. That reminds me of if you've ever done a talk and you go back and you look at still photographs of you on stage and and 98% of them, you're making a strange face. <laughs> if you If you were watching yourself do those moments, you would never step on a stage because it's horrifying. That's so true. And it's that reminder that that's not what anyone else is experiencing because they're not watching this, like they're not, they're watching the whole experience of everything, not these brief moments that you're catching when you look at a still photograph or yourself on camera in a conversation. And we're also hypercritical of our physical selves. I mean, we, we all are our own worst critics and we see things nobody else sees. So for example, I was working with a client, this was several years ago, and I was doing uh, on-camera training for in-studio work. So for that kind of work, I always do like a baseline presentation at the beginning, and then I teach best practices, and then we do like a post-training video. And we were watching her post-training video, my back was to her, and she had made huge strides. She had really improved, I was so excited. And I turned around and I said, what did you think? And she said, my right eyebrow is higher than my left eyebrow. And I was like, what are you talking about? No one notices that, but she did. And that was where her focus was. So recognize that even when you do watch yourself on screen, it's not what people are seeing that you are fixated on. Uh, you know, it, it's a, but I even do it myself. I had to recently record a series of videos and I'm watching myself thinking, man, <laughs> I wish I did these 10 years ago, I would have less wrinkles, you know? So even somebody who's been on camera for gosh, my entire adult life, I still don't like watching myself or listening to myself yeah. whenever I'm recorded. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that I appreciate you sharing that because I think that um, people are often under the illusion that their experience is unique to them in this regard. For sure. Yeah. Right? And it's not, it it's is not, it's it's practically such- universal yes totally. <laughs> yeah i it, i mean the number of actors performers who hate watching themselves on video that's their job and they're like you cannot pay me to watch my own my own movie you cannot pay me to watch a, a voiceover of, or listen to a voiceover i've done i hate my record because we all have that we all have that experience of hyper being hypercritical and what our experience being in our head is very yeah. different than outside of, it doesn't mean it's just different yeah, I always mention, uh, you know, if you are old enough, you might have had an answering machine or at least your, your voicemail message. And probably the first time you heard it, you're like, I don't sound like that. <laughs> and the bottom line is you probably do sound like that, but it feels, it sounds different to your ears than what you hear inside your head. And, and it's, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> You just, but the thing is like, the more you do it, the more comfortable you become with it. And because I've been talking through a camera for many decades, I I'm unfazed by it. Like if you would meet me in person, Celine, I would be the same person that you're seeing right now. Um, But it's a matter of recognizing that the camera is the conduit to your conversation partner. So if you treat that camera as your person you're talking to and you pour your energy through it, uh, it's going to feel more comfortable to you, but that requires you not to watch yourself on the screen, but right. actually to engage with the camera lens. Yes. Yeah. I think that um, 
so I this is a very technical question, but you've just made me very curious about something. Okay. So I have had the experience of being on camera, like in a conversation like this with someone who looks who looked very directly into I'm going to do it as an example right now, yep, go, very go directly it. into the camera lens when they were talking, yep. which in terms of thinking they're looking at you was very effective. Mm -hmm. But it was also very, it felt very disconnected at the same time. Because you to Interesting. me, Okay, to, as the so, re recipient. Of yes. The message. So okay. while they're looking directly into and this was and I'm curious, and I this is not right or wrong. This is genuine, okay. genuine yeah, curiosity. Yeah, yeah. They had very been clear, very clearly been taught to interact with the camera lens, which is a great thing. I recognize that. But something wasn't translating to actually connecting to me on the other side of the camera. That's interesting. Do you and, have any diagnose? Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Okay. This is why I was like, this is <laughs> okay. a super tactical question. Right. No, it I'm is true. really so, curious. Right, right. So the the typical advice is if you want to speak with impact, then you should be directing the majority of your focus to the camera lens, like you're experiencing it right now. Right. I mean, right. to me, it's on it's almost like second nature. Um, when you are not speaking, then by all means look at the screen and read the body language of the person who is talking. Right. Um, so if that person was not appearing to connect with you and appear disconnected, something tells me that they were told, look at the camera lens, but they weren't in the proper mental mindset. Mm. So the proper mental mindset is the camera represents a person. You're having a conversation with that person only a couple of feet away, like across the dinner table. And you need to be in that conversation space in, a, in order to come across as authentic. Because otherwise, if you're just looking at the lens and you are just basically like, you're looking at the lens, but you're not really connecting, you lose all of that expressiveness. Like I'm trying to kind of model it right now. Like if yeah. I were just talking to no one. Um, so the the authenticity, the animation comes from changing your mental mindset. And if you haven't done that, that's when the eye contact will just appear to be contrived. Mm. Do so, you think that makes sense? Now it, I'm really well, curious. Yeah, no, no, it does. And I, and I appreciate you modeling that because it's when you can see it in action, it becomes a lot easier to, to recognize, right? And to be like, oh yes, that's what I experienced. Um, and, you know, it's, I, my guess is that it comes with practice and working with someone like you who knows these things and can share, here's why this matters and here's how you do this. Well, it's so funny, Celine, because people are always like, you're so uh, polished on camera. I'm like, I'm really not. I think I'm just myself. And that's what resonates with yeah. people. And I think that's a good lesson to learn. If you try to be a performer, you're trying to do the wrong thing. You just want to have a conversation with somebody who is a little bit harder to see in this yeah. environment. But the one thing I would mention is you don't want to be held captive by the camera either, because that's not how we engage with people whenever we're talking to them face to face. We look away. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, if we, if we wouldn't, we'd be staring at them the entire time and, and <laughs> boring a hole in their brains. And that makes them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So you have to interact with the camera lens the way you would with somebody face to face, which means that, yeah, maybe you begin looking into the camera and then you're always looking away, thinking yeah. about what you're saying next and you come back to them. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really the mental mindset, which you, you pinpointed is so critical. And I hope uh, that people take that away from this podcast more than anything else. And I love that you mentioned looking away because that's that is one of my things. I'm I always like I'm always my eyes are always wandering, and I've had people say that it, it's like, you know, it's much more effective if you just look directly at the camera. And I'm like, I this is not how I talk. This is not how I talk to anyone ever. I'm constantly, I, I'm expressive. I'm looking away. I'm thinking. If I'm I can't look at someone's face and think. It really is like I would. My eyes are wandering. So it is yeah. about having it feel natural and not performative. Having it yeah. not be the screen act, the, the acting that happens otherwise. Right. And that's, what's so frustrating when people are like, you know, you're such a good actor. I'm like, I'm like, eh, I'm really not. <laughs> I, I, I'm good at being myself. Um, but, but a couple of tricks that, that your uh, listeners and viewers can use is uh, take a picture of a family member or a friend and put it beside your camera lens, just to mm -hmm. remind yourself that you're talking to a person because yeah. 
that disconnection is a result of people just feeling like they're talking to no one. And it's so interesting too, Celine, at the beginning of any of my uh, workshops or webinars, I always ask the audience the, the same question. Uh, whenever you're talking through a webcam, how many people do you think you're talking to? Do you think you're talking to no one, an infinite number, depends on the size of the meeting or one person? And that everybody answers differently, which is crazy if you think about it. So you have the range of no one to an infinite number. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the appropriate answer would be one person, because no matter how many people are on a call, they all feel like you are talking just to them. And I kind yeah. of experienced this even in TV news. Whenever I was uh, an anchor, I would go into the grocery store and people would come up to me and be like, Karen Reed, how are you? How are your kids? They would talk to me like I was a close personal friend. Yeah. And you could think that that's odd, or you can consider it really kind of interesting because you go into their homes on an almost daily basis in a very personal sort of way. So you create this very intimate connection with your viewers, um, and no matter how many people are out there. Uh, and it's important to remember that. Yeah. So again, super tactical question. Um, I love this because you're, I want to ask 500 things. Okay. I'm going to ask this. So if you are, um, is there a difference, but so you, you had suggested that you could put up like a picture of a loved one by your camera when you're, so that you're, it's like, you're talking to someone directly. So it's, I'm looking at my camera. There's a picture here. I'm talking to this person. It feels more intimate and connected. Right. Makes sense. Is that different if you're in a zoom meeting with 40 people and you get on camera to, do you still want to have that person there is it different you know i can is it different if you're pre-recording a training is it different if you're in a one-on-one -on -one? like what i can I feel always like an audience of one celine no I, matter right. how many people are on that meeting at all everyone feels like you're talking just to them right so what i do recommend though is visualizing your viewer which means visualize a representative of your audience um, so <laughs> because that makes a big difference in, in your, how you uh engage you know sure. if, if your audience is made up of your friends and you're having a zoom happy hour that's very different <laughs> than if you are talking to, you know, your um, board of directors. Uh, so you have to think about a representative of that specific audience and then talk to him or her through the camera lens. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think that is very helpful because I, I, I do think that people get stuck in the, the details of things like that. For sure. Um, I want to go back to something you said at the beginning, which was that when this madness hit in March of last year that you had the fortune because it really is fortune oh for sure being yeah. in a position of everyone suddenly saying hi Karen we need your help with stuff yes crisis have, blessing yes <laughs> you have a thing that we need to know yes um many things you have many things that we need help with um and I want to I'm curious how you led your team through that what you learned from that experience and then what if you you know looking back that you'd say i wouldn't do it that way again maybe mm. <laughs> okay probably the biggest mistake i made is my first client i created a package for them uh, that was incredibly comprehensive and incredibly intensive yeah and i had myself booked out until december 22nd literally. Wow. And I, thought, I could just have this one client. And then gosh, like the 20 others came behind. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. So literally my, my weeks, I, I, I worked practically nonstop. Uh, yeah. And so I learned that I have to make sense in the decisions yeah. <laughs> that I make relative to uh, capacity. Um, I learned that I needed to be better at teaching others uh, how to amplify what we do. Um, so when I brought people on, I think I became better, hopefully, at being a mentor to those who are coming into uh, the organization so that they could do good work as well. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't have a big team, uh, but it, it's that's by design. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm 
very connected to quality control. Yep. <laughs> so the folks who, who come on, they, they, you know, I'm looking for a variety of, of, um, characteristics as well as background. Um, so, you know, there aren't a huge number of people who can kind of fit that mold. And, uh, so I, I think it really stretched me to be much more, um, attuned to my management style and also to standardize because so much of what I did was up here. And if you are going to scale, it can't stay in your head. You've got to get it out there. Uh, so that was um, a big lesson that I learned and, and had lots of growing pains along the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think that it's very, I think a lot of leaders, whether they are in large or small organizations by design or not, I think that's really valuable for them to hear because I think a lot of them had very similar experiences. Hmm. Well, and I think that you have an expectation that everybody knows everything that you know, <laughs> and that's not okay. Um, yeah. And and so I, I hope that I got better at explaining things and uh, just not making the mistakes of omission <laughs> and, and just helping to empower them to be as, as uh, great as I know they are and, 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 could have been so. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I want to ask, I want to ask a question about where you think, what leaders can do as we continue to, so I think, let me start by saying this. Let, okay. me, let me start by stating my assumption. Okay. I think that we are going to be spending a lot more time on camera doing virtual meetings in the next iteration of whatever work looks like. I don't think we're going back to the full-time in-person anything. I think it's a hybrid model going forward. And I think that's great. So my starting assumption, I want to be. Okay. Yes. I think your assumption is spot on. Okay. I actually just wrote an article for training industry magazine about managing the hybrid meeting. Uh, so all of the trends indicate that this is indeed going to be the case because there are a lot of reasons why, first of all, the there are going to be folks who will want to come back to the brick and mortar office. Absolutely. Will be so excited about that. But there are also going to be quite a few who are like, you know what, this remote work is kind of working for me. Yeah. And my productivity didn't dip. So they can make the case for why they'd want to at least be home some of the time. Mm -hmm. So that is going to require a whole different way of thinking about work. It's going to be, uh, you know, work is what we do. It's not where we go. Yes. So with that in mind, you're in this hybrid model, which is going to have to connect all of these people working in what we're calling networks. So Joe and I are uh, Dr. Allen, I call yeah. him Joe. We can call him Dr. Joe. Uh, so we were talking about, you know, the big challenge that's going to be happening soon is how do you make um, communication flow in a hybrid meeting? Because right. The vision is you've got three people in a conference room in this location. You've got three people in a conference room in this location. You've got like maybe five people who are showing up in the meeting on their individual webcams. That is super challenging because you got a bunch of di different, I will call them networks. So the three people in one location, that's a network. Three people in the other location, that's a network. And then those who are all appearing on the screen, that's their own network. And so as a leader, you're going to have to figure out how to ensure that all of the communication flows to these three networks. So that is going to require some really proactive facilitation, right. uh, also a real effort to pull out even participation, because there's going to be a lot of bias, you know, whenever bias towards, you know, people who are in the same room with you, I've experienced it myself when I've taught hybrid classes, I always felt like one group or the other was getting short shrift. So maybe it was the people who are joining virtually, maybe it was the people who are in person. It's very difficult uh, to play to all um, stakeholders. So it's incumbent upon organizations to start training their people to be better facilitators of that sort of meeting and also to be really cognizant of, okay, what kind of technology do we need? What sort of... Um, you know, settings do we need in the office to allow for all these folks to be able to talk to each other uh, efficiently? How do you make sure that you don't have silos of communication or like side meetings that occur? You know, because the three people over here, they could have their own little meeting. This group can have their own meeting and they don't talk to each other at all. Um, so the, the leader is going to have to get them to talk to each other. Uh, so there, there's all sorts of um, uncharted territory 
uh, that is just on the horizon that we're going to have to figure out how to navigate. So keep it because I agree with you. I think that is definitely the future of where this is going. It's why I was like, let me state my assumption up front because I want to be clear <laughs> that's what I'm starting from. Yeah. So as people are sort of starting to navigate this, as leaders are facing this as like, this is our real situation. This is what we're going to be doing. Do you have any starting tips or starting things that they can even start to think about to help navigate the murkiness? Because there's no one solution right now. I recognize that. But what should they be thinking of how, what, is there anything they can do as they start this process? Absolutely. Well, I think that first of all, it's acknowledging that it is likely to happen because if you're sitting here thinking, oh, business is going to go back to the way it was in 2019, that's not going to be the case. So be prepared for change and be uh, willing to adapt. I would say also put some careful consideration into standardizing the equipment so those who choose to work from home can do so effectively. Uh, that has been kind of all over the board. There are some companies that have said, okay, everybody's getting an excellent external webcam and a headset. So you have crisp audio and you have a great image quality. Um, those folks recognize that having good, what I call personal production value is important because it's not a matter of vanity. It's a matter of being respectful of the people you're in conversation with, because if you have your face in shadow, if your audio is all crackly, uh, that's like forcing somebody to have a phone conversation with you when the connection is bad. It's annoying and it's irritating. So ensuring that all of your people show up looking and sounding great is really, really important. Uh, then I'd also suggest start training up your leaders so that they know how to manage uh, that sort of meeting, uh, you know, get them some help. And of course, you could buy our book, Suddenly Virtual, which will talk about hybrid meetings as well as all these uh, virtual meetings and, you know, combination of best practices with new best practices or old best practices and new best practices. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, um, Thanks for letting me plug it. So no, like oh my gosh, are you kidding? I, I, I want to make sure we plug it again. It's, you said it's coming out on March. March 9th. 9th. Okay, good. I was going to say Available 9th. anywhere you find books. Um, I, th I hope that all of the listeners and viewers of this check it out because I think it's a really, I think especially for leaders, especially if you're dealing with team dynamics and as everyone is right now dealing with this, this hybrid model even if it's temporarily, which I don't think it is, but if, even as a temporary measure, I think that this book is going to be wildly helpful for mm -hmm. everyone who is leading teams and, and wants to lead teams. So I, I really recommend that they, that they get a copy of it. And I will say, as you were saying that, you know, being face in shadow, I was like, as the light has changed, my room has gotten so dark. So I am putting you through what you were saying people shouldn't be doing. So thank you. I can still read me. your facial expressions, Celine. No, you were fine. You were fine. But it does help to have an external light source that you can kind of dial up and down. So that's, that's one of the tricks that I have. Yeah, I have my external light sources connected to my external camera and I cannot do it while we're on the camera. Oh, so I was no. like, oh, wow. <laughs> Tips for me for next time. See, this is this is learning for me also. I can I'll figure something better out for next time. Um, Karen, I want to thank you for your time. And before we wrap up, I just want to ask, is there anything that you want to leave a sort of a final and the answer can be no, you don't have to say it, you don't have to have anything. But is there anything you want to emphasize or leave as sort of a final thought for people who might be, you know, walking away from this conversation with all of your brilliance in their brain? Well, uh, you, you were very kind. Thank you. But I think what I would say to leaders is please set a good example for your folks, because what uh, Dr. Allen found is that having a webcam on in virtual meetings is one of the biggest in indicators of whether that meeting is going to be effective uh, or not. So if you as a leader turn the webcam on and, and spend a little time just taking a look at how you're showing up on, on the screen and, and being sure that you have good audio, that is going to set the standard for your organization. I have so many more questions, but I will refrain <laughs> for the time being. I think that's, I'm so curious about the leaders who are not putting their webcams on, who are running meetings in this way. So hence why I'm like, oh, I have so many questions, but I think that is a I think that's really important for people to keep in mind and thank you for for sharing that um and so for we will have in our show notes we will have a link to karen's website 
um and her book comes out on march 9th so everyone should be pre-ordering that and getting copies of that um and karen i want to thank you very much for coming and speaking with me about this today it's been really lovely getting to to know you and to hear your lens on this and i really appreciate your openness to sharing and the experience that you bring to this conversation it's really valuable for everyone who is listening uh, and anyone who is running a business or leading in any way right now so thank you celine thank you it has been my pleasure thanks for joining me today on the leading through crisis podcast if you enjoyed this conversation please take a minute to rate and review us on your podcast app if you're interested in learning more about any of our guests you can find us online at www.leadingthroughcrisis.ca